Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today we got a special video. We're gonna look at the full solution of the short I submitted last week. Uh, in that video, we looked at a giant ice ball and I placed the ice ball in three different fluids. We had a water, we had corn syrup, and the third case was the ice ball was floating in vegetable oil. Now in all those cases, the question was, what happens to the level of the fluid when the ice ball completely melts? So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna highlight what are the key concepts and you'll get to a full understanding of why we saw the results in the previous short. All right, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to Physics Ninja. It's the best way to support what I do. All right, let's get started. In all three cases, the ice cube is seen to float. Therefore, we have an equilibrium condition where the buoyancy force must be equal to the weight of the ice. After, I grab a marker and I carefully mark the level of the fluid in the glass for each case. What do you think happens now when that ice completely melts? What do you think happens to the level of the fluid? For each case, do you think the level of the fluid will rise above that line, go below the line, or stay at the same level? For case one, we can see that as the ice ball gets smaller and smaller as it melts, the fluid level stays exactly at that line. For case two, we can see that as the ice melts, there's a layer of water above the corn syrup. In this case, you can clearly see that the level of the fluid goes above the original line. In case three, we can see that as the ice melts, the water will accumulate at the bottom of the cup. In this case, we can see that the total level of the fluid actually goes below the original line. All right, to understand this problem, we really have to look at two key points. Uh, the first is conservation of mass. Conservation of mass means that whatever mass I have for that giant ice ball, when it melts, it will convert to a certain volume of water, but that volume of water has to have the same mass because I'm not changing the number of water molecules that make up the ice or subsequent uh, volume of water once it completely melts. So that is an important step. Uh, the other really important key point here is that in all of these three cases, we have that the ice ball is seen to float in this fluid. Now it might float at different levels and that will depend on the density of the fluid, but in all three cases it floats. And that means if you draw a free body diagram on that ice ball, we have the weight of the ice acting down and then we're going to have a buoyancy force acting up. And these forces must be equal and opposite in order for that ice ball to remain in equilibrium and to seem floating like this. Let's look at the mathematics now behind each of those key points. So the first question we had was, how much water are you going to get? What is the volume of water you will get when the ice completely melts? Okay, and the key was that the mass here doesn't change. Mass will not change. So if you're gonna write that as an equation, well, I would say whatever mass of the ice I have has to be equal to whatever mass of the water that I'm going to get once the ice completely melts. Now it is useful here to represent this in terms of densities. Okay, so if you remember the definition of density, I used the letter rho, and the density of any object here is given by its mass divided by its volume. So let's use this key equation here just to rewrite my mass in terms of the density multiplied by the volume. So if I work on the ice side, I'm going to have the density of the ice multiplied by the volume of the ice ball that we had. That's the total mass of the ice. How about the water now? You're gonna get this volume of water down here and its mass is going to be the density of water multiplied by the volume of water that you will get once the ice completely melts. All right, so my first equation that I wanna get is what is the volume of water that we will obtain when the ice melts? You just divide through by the density of water and you get this ratio here of density of ice over the density of water. All of that gets multiplied by that initial volume of the ice that we had. So let me go ahead and box this up because this is our first key equation. Now, if you were going to look up some numbers, well, you would look up, for example, the density of water is 1,000 
kilograms per meter cube. The density of the ice is approximately uh, 900 kilograms per meter cube, uh, which means what? If you substitute those numbers in here, look what you get. The volume of the water that you're going to get is going to be about 9 tenths. You're going to do 900 over 1,000 multiplied by whatever that total volume of this ice ball was. So you get less volume because the density of water is bigger than the density of ice. Our second key point is that the ice was floating in each of those cases in the various fluids. Uh, if it floats, it means we have a free body diagram that looks something like this. We have the weight of the ice uh, at the beginning, and that must be equal to the buoyant force. And the buoyant force is given by Archimedes' principle, which says it's equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. All right, in each one of those cases, what is the displaced fluid. Well, again, whatever part of that ice ball is below the surface here, that is what gets displaced. So we have to figure out what is the weight of this displaced fluid that would occupy this one if the ice wasn't there. So let's go right down our mathematical expression. So we have mass of the ice multiplied by little g, and the weight of the displaced fluid, well, it's the mass of the displaced fluid Again, multiplied by little g. Let me just go ahead and cancel out those little g's right away and clean this up. Now, um, in order to proceed, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use the same argument I did before. Let's write the mass in terms of a density and a volume, and it's going to help me cancel things out uh, in the next step. So the mass of the ice, you can write as the density of the ice. And again, here it would be multiplied here by the total volume of that ice ball, which I'm calling volume of ice. Now, what is the mass of the displaced fluid? Now, since I'm dealing with three different cases, I'm just going to call it the density of the fluid. So water for case one, corn syrup for case two, and vegetable oil for case three. Now, I need to multiply a density by which volume? I'm going to call this here the volume that is submerged. This is how much volume I'm actually displacing of the fluid. So we call this V sub. All right, my last one, let's just divide through by the density of the ice, and this is going to be my second important equation. So we have that the volume of the ice, the total volume of the ice, uh, must be equal to this ratio here of the densities, fluid over the density of the ice, multiplied by whatever volume is submerged. All right, this is going to be our second important equation. Now let's put it all together and get to the result. All right, what we have to do now is we have to make a comparison. And the comparison that you want to make now is you want to compare the result we had from uh, the first expression, the volume of the water that we got when all that ice melts. You want to see whether or not compare that volume to this volume of uh, we got in the second expression, which says the volume submerged. Okay, because there's really three different cases you can look at. If all of my volume of water that I get from that ice ball melting fits inside this submerged part of the ice cube right here, well, that means that the level is going to stay the exact same. I like to picture this volume submerged as being just a container. Now, clearly, if all the water fills this volume completely, the water levels overall will stay the same. Uh, the next thing, well, what happens if this volume of water I get from the melted ice is bigger than this size of the container, which I call V sub? That means overall now the level of the fluids should go up once all that ice turns into water. And the last case, if I take all that volume of water and it doesn't have enough volume to fill up this volume submerged for that specific case, well, that means that the overall level will go down. So now let's put our two equations together and see what we come up with. All right, so these were the two mathematical expressions we had obtained. Let's start with our first one. We had the volume of the water is equal to, again, the density of the ice over the density of water. And now instead of multiplying that by volume of the ice, I had an expression for volume of the ice in the second equation. So let me go ahead and substitute volume of the ice using this second equation. So you see you get density of the fluid divided by density of the ice and multiplied by V submerged. 
Oh, my writing is horrible here. Let's try to clean this up. Volume submerged. Now, from this expression, you can see that the density of the ice here cancels out, and you're left with one final expression, that the volume of the water is going to be equal to the density of the fluid, which is different in each of those three cases, divided by the density of water, and now multiplied by V submerged. So let's look at this expression now for our three different cases. All right, so now we look at our expression for the three different cases. I just write the volume of water here on the left-hand side, and that equals to, well, let's look at this ratio for case number one. The fluid is also water. Therefore, density of water over density of water gives me one. It means that the volume of the water you get from the melted ice equals to V submerged. And V submerged is simply this kind of like imaginary container. It means you're gonna fill up this container here Exactly, and that simply means that the level stays the same, same level. All right, in case number two, let's have a look. We have that the volume of the water, it's always the same, all the melted ice turns into how much water? Well, um, in this case here, what do we get? The density of the fluid for the corn syrup is bigger than the density of water. So that ratio here, guess what? That ratio here is going to be bigger than one. So for this one, what do we get? We're going to get a number, density of the corn syrup over density of the water. That's gonna be a number bigger than one. Therefore, the density, uh, the volume of the water is simply bigger than the volume submerged. We might get like 1.1 for this or 1.2, depending on the density of that uh, corn syrup. So it's certainly going to be bigger than the volume submerged. It means that for this smaller container here, all the water does not fit in this container. You have overflow. So that overflow is simply gonna raise the level, okay? So it goes up. All right, and in the bottom case, what you're gonna get here is that the volume of the water you get from the melted ice, in this case, it's going to be less than the V submerged uh, because the density of the oil is less than the density of the water. So here I may get like 0.9 or 0.95, for example, okay? So that is going to be a number that's less than V submerged. That means that, again, if I have this imaginary container, the container is big. And once I melt all that ice, it might only go up to this level. So the rest will get filled up uh, by the oil. And that means overall that the level goes down. All right, folks, hopefully you understood this video. Uh, that's it for me. We'll see you next time.